Thanks for everybody for coming back again. We're about to start. Um, uh, the the clear, critical figure is called Edward Snowden, and he's about to be on this screen, and uh, we're expecting uh, confirmation of that almost immediately. So um, I'll hopefully we'll wait calmly for that to happen. We hope it happens. We don't have actually a telephone line open to him, so we're just hoping that the connection works well, and we do now. Excellent. Okay, apparently the connection is open. So that's very good. So be patient. We'll have it very quickly. And then we'll be a few remarks immediately afterwards. And then we're all free for drinks. But the most important thing is Edward Snowden. And we'll wait for him now. Hey, there he is. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. There you go. Edward Snowden. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Hello. <laughs> I, I, I will point out I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing the moderator uh, because there's a little bit of audio feedback. But generally, if we could speak about one thing, what the, the general challenge is that we're, we're facing in this new terrain, of, of mass surveillance that the government likes to euphemize as bulk collection. We need to think about what it means. Now, there have been a lot of people who have talked you know, throughout the conference about the issues, about the impacts it has, and about what we can do about it through technical means, through political means, uh, to try to address these challenges. Uh, but we need to think about how we got here in the first place. We think, okay, we could get legal reform. Uh, but the courts that have reviewed these programs since 2013 have found if we can't rely on the law, what can we rely on? There are a number of people at the, uh, the symposium who I think have much more radical politics than I do. And that's a good thing. Uh, I come from a federal background. I'm sort of a product of the bureaucracy. And that creates a lot of problems because I tend to be too conservative in the ways that I approach things. I tend to be overly concerned with the risk that something could go wrong. Uh, and while it's good to be cautious, we need to think about what that means for our chances of success in actually reforming the issues we're facing. Now, reforming things within the system is the ideal. It's the way it should work. It's the way that uh, our society was designed to function. But what happens when you have failures across institutions? This is what produces whistleblowers. Whistleblowers are the safeguard of last resort. When we have a comprehensive failure across all branches of government. Uh, I apologize, I'm gonna take my earbuds out for a second because the feedback. I apologize, what's uh, going on with the feed there. Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. All right, so we've got these groups, we've got these cypherpunks, we have these individuals who see the problems occurring in technology and where inevitably this is going to lead us. Uh, because we think about the abuses in the one-off positions and we have this uh, natural inclination uh, to think that they're extraordinary, to think they're departures from the natural order of things. Uh, we can address these issues, we can address these abuses in a narrow sense, and everything will be better again. Everything will be fixed. We can rely once more upon the system. But it turns out abuse is the byproduct of power. And whenever we begin to center However, we begin to aggregate power uh, in increasingly smaller groups. <laughs> Apologize uh, for the technical difficulties here. Um, whenever we have these increasingly small groups with greater and greater periods of power, uh, we get abuses of this power. Now, that circumstance is where we have to search for new mechanisms. That mechanism today is technology. The technology that we're relying on are things like encryption, like encrypted communications, 
uh, that enforce our rights through the systems that we rely upon every day, the things that are underlying the background, the fabric of our communications. And see that across borders, this is representing a threat that governments really don't want to deal with. And this is not about liberal states, not about authoritarian states. It's about the capability to the nature of government, the nature of society, the nature of our civil organizations. Okay, we're trying again here. <laughs> If I could condense the point, there's an intersection of technology and access to information in society. We refer to this as the communications fabric that we all rely upon today. The internet is the shorthand for it, uh, but it existed before that. It's simply all our telephony and all of these other capabilities are in a global mesh that increasingly impacts the lives of all of us, but over which we have less and less influence over time. Now, the application of new technologies, our science, such as encryption, uh, mathematics, secure communications, allows us to enforce these rights across borders, uh, whether you're a liberal state, whether you're a authoritarian state, whether you're trying to make sure that someone can communicate between a journalist and a source in the United States uh, or Russia or China or somewhere else. This is what we have to do. We have to accept that the only way to protect the rights of one is to protect the rights of all. But increasingly, this represents a threat to government because they see this as a domain of activity that they'll no longer be able to intervene in. They'll no longer be able to regulate. Uh, the president of the United States just yesterday spoke at South by Southwest uh, on the Apple versus FBI controversy. Uh, and he, again, contextualized it in the false choice between privacy and security. But the reality is we can have both. But we can only have both if we have one or the other. If we don't have privacy, we can't have security. Uh, we don't have an open society. We don't have a free society. We don't have the liberal tradition that we ourselves inherited. Rather than watching people because you have some suspicion that they've done something wrong, you're watching everybody all the time because they could abuse their liberties, but not because they have. Now, why does this matter? Why do we care about the metadata? Uh, why do we care about sort of this bulk collection, this pre-criminal surveillance regime that's now occurring? And I would argue that Thomas Drake, speaking yesterday actually, had the, the most succinct and important uh, case study for this, which is Jeffrey Sterling. Uh, this is a CIA employee uh, who allegedly, they've been convicted on this basis, of being the source of a prominent reporter at the New York Times, uh, who is investigating CIA activities. And this individual had witnessed a case where the United States government uh, was trying to run an operation against Iran. And because of mistakes, poor handling of the case of the operation, they actually uh, advanced Iran's nuclear program by trying to uh, provide them with nuclear weapons plans that were flawed, but the flaws were trivially detected. Uh, and so the Iranians simply remediated flaw, and now they had a new design that they could use. He pointed out quite rightly that the only evidence put forth at the trial was the fact that this individual had access to the information and that there were metadata communication records between this individual and the journalist. Now, in, in previous eras, this would be considered circumstantial evidence. It wouldn't pass the burden of reasonable doubt. But this individual was convicted on that basis which means every individual who thinks about calling a journalist now recognizes that whether or not they actually did anything, whether or the not they were actually the source, simply calling a journalist and having access to information is enough to get you convicted in a court of law. Now, this dynamic between the activities of our press uh, and the activities of our communication sector have to be resolved. We have to create a fabric that is reliable, that is transparent, that doesn't rely upon expertise. Uh, there are great, truly great projects uh, that we should all be excited about, like Subgraph OS that was, uh, you know, just revealed yesterday, uh, came out of Alpha or is going into Alpha. Uh, 
And I, I plan to use this myself. Uh, but we have to recognize that these things are still inaccessible for the majority of users. These are inaccessible for journalists. These are inaccessible for most people who aren't specialists. And this leaves us in the state we have today that's completely backwards, where we're reliant upon groups like Apple, for-profit groups, corporate groups, uh, to stand up and defend our rights, when that should be happening regardless of whether or not a corporation thinks this is the right thing or the wrong thing to do. We have to rely upon the fabric. We have to rely upon the protocols and the systems uh, that are underlying invisibly the standards of communication. Now, what does this actually look like? What does this actually mean? This means a change in our political thinking where we begin to get a little bit more radical as both technologists and journalists. We have a messaging problem. When the president of the United States can argue that factual positions uh, that have been arrived at by studies at groups like MIT, uh, computer science researchers, cryptographers, that say there is no safe way to provide exceptional access to the encrypted communications of one group without endangering uh, the protection that we all enjoy. And he pushed this forth as what he termed an absolutist position. If we're reaching a dynamic in the public discussion where facts are considered absolutist, we're in trouble. Now, this has happened throughout history where we've seen these sort of extraordinary imbalances of power. And we've seen backlashes. We've seen people who are disenfranchised, who don't have access to the means of determining their own destiny, try to remediate this. And how? what did that look like? Now, I'm not a communist, uh, but previously we've had generations of thinkers that argued well, we could resolve the issues of income inequality by seizing the means of production. We're very rapidly approaching a point in human history where we will need to seize the means of our communication. This This is dangerous. It's risky. There's friction involved. We're relying upon smaller and smaller groups of uh, very sophisticated technical actors who are dedicating their time uh, to very little material benefit because a lot of these things are not commercially viable technologies. And once they become commercialized, they become co-opted and subverted. Uh, and what if they get it wrong, right? Uh, what if they make a mistake? What if the things that they push out there for protocol uses can be abused? Well, this will likely happen. There will be mistakes made, uh, just as there have been throughout every endeavor in human history. When we think about press publication, this is one of the clearest examples. The press gets details wrong. Uh, I know this personally. I've lived through it, right? Uh, both in my favor and against me. Uh, but that doesn't mean we give up. That doesn't mean we stop writing stories. That doesn't mean we stop pursuing the truth. Uh, instead, we work together, we learn the lessons, and we keep moving forward because the cause is just and it is also necessary. Today, we are ceding entirely too much control to both institutions, which we are supposed to be able to trust, but unfortunately, facts are giving us more and more evidence we cannot trust. Uh, at the same time, that we see corporations uh, gaining more and more access to our lives, our private records, uh, even through legitimate voluntary uh, purposes, you know, trade, you want to call an Uber taxi or whatever. Uh, but then it's used for purposes that we did not anticipate, we did not agree to, or we were not aware that they would be used. Now, I don't want to sound like a techno utopian here, uh, although it's difficult to think about what solutions would look like that are not primarily technical. Because if we have the most extraordinary reforms in Germany tomorrow, the impact of those reforms will stop at its borders. And we have a big, big world with many, many people who are increasingly reliant, increasingly vulnerable to the exploitation of our associations and our communications. Uh, and I think if we don't, commit in a very real way, and ultimately in a very radical way, to taking risks and to recognizing that, yes, 
uh, in the system of justice that we've all inherited, there will be difficulties that will be faced by law enforcement that they can't trivially get over. They can't just flip a switch and get access to any phone uh, because that would mean that no one's safe wherever they are. Uh, that would mean that adversaries, criminal groups, foreign spies could do the same thing. But this isn't the end of the world. We have seen law enforcement agencies in these times of trouble where they were not granted the ability to simply walk into all our houses and search them while we're away, uh, develop new methods unilaterally uh, that were concerning, but they were limited in their reach only to proper and appropriate targets by nature of how they did it. For example, when police realized that uh, fingerprint databases could be of investigative use uh, in determining was this individual's fingerprints found or were they found at a crime scene, they fingerprinted their suspects, right? And when these people were convicted, they kept their fingerprints and stored them and so on and so forth. Eventually, they did the same thing with DNA databases. They did not compel everybody in the country uh, or everybody who checks in at a hospital to have that hospital turn over your DNA for the government's use. This is the dynamic that we must understand and we must enforce. We as a public, we as a community must assert in the strongest uh, and least flexible, the most fact-based and reliable, the most secure manner, the protections that we can for the enforcement of basic human rights beyond borders. We wanna make sure that not only German citizens uh, enjoy guarantees of their basic human rights, not only Americans, not only Westerners, but people in Central Africa, uh, people in Southeast Asia, uh, people in Latin America. And the only way and the only way to protect the rights of one person is to protect them all. Now, this is going to be a fight politically because we see that politicians are consumed by the ease of fear in messaging. Uh, they have recognized over the last decade plus uh, that saying this will save lives uh, is persuasive to the average voter. Uh, we will never reach a point in society, I believe, uh, where the average individual has time in their day because they have to work, they have to take care of their family. We all have different obligations to gain a specialist level of knowledge and understanding uh, to be able to look at how they can adjust these balances. When the government says this will save lives, uh, people are inclined to believe them. But let's look at the actual facts. Let's look at the case of September 11th. Uh, in the United States, we had a congressional investigation, uh, the 9-11 Commission, that looked into all the facts. It had access to all the classified information from the CIA, the NSA, the FBI. And they found that it wasn't a case that we weren't collecting enough. We had all of the information we needed to thwart the plot. The problem was our focus was so scattered because we were targeting so many things. We were focusing on so many issues. We had so many programs that were collecting so much that we did not understand what we had and we did not share it appropriately. And because of this, more than 3,000 lives were lost. Now, when we have politicians today that are saying we need to collect more, when we have parliament in France that's saying, we need to make sure that every manufacturer uh, undermines the security of systems, gives us a backdoor, simply because some individual in an edge case, a rare case, could use it uh, in the commission of a grievous crime. Uh, they're making us all less safe and they are likely putting lives at risk rather than saving them. This is something that we have to focus on. Now, 9-11 is not an isolated case. Uh, in the Boston Marathon bombings in my country, uh, we had two individuals uh, operating in the wake of the largest, most indiscriminate dragnet surveillance program in the history of my country. And despite the fact that they were collecting the telephonic communications of everyone, both inside the United States and outside the United States, it didn't help at all. Because you have individuals who operate off the grid. Osama bin Laden stopped using a cell phone in 1998. He's not reading the newspapers today. He's gone now. His analogs are not reading the newspapers today and making their decisions on the basis of what the New York Times uh, political debates are about. Yes, they do read newspapers. Yes, uh, this will inform the thinking the same as everybody else does. But we should not give up our access to a free press because it might. 
in some potential edge case, impact the actions of one criminal, when on the other hand, it empowers the whole of our society. At the end of the day, we have to make a decision. And this is, do we want to be a controlled society? Whether or not there's an argument that it will make us more safe, uh, or do we want to live in a free one? Because you can't have both. I apologize for the technical difficulties. If we have any, are there questions in the room? Difficult <laughs> to, to do, okay. Questions in this room? Raise your hand, I come to you. Thank you so much for joining us. One of the things I've been talking with, having conversations lately with people is about the next billion people. Can you give us some advice about how you see the people that have never touched a network device, how we can incorporate them into a secure computing environment? Uh, so I have to apologize. I actually can't hear the question through the, audio, through the uh, audio input they're using. I'm not sure if they can get it directly in through the laptop audio. Uh, or if you could repeat it, all I got from it was it was about France uh, and how do you secure the network. But can you give me a little bit more nuance there? Because that's a big question. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. That's, that's perfect. Thank you. One of the big challenges here is people's relationships to their devices, people's relationship to the network. Uh, one of the tremendously damaging things culturally uh, that has occurred as a product of the smartphone economy is that people have become very comfortable with intermediaries providing them access to every service, uh, providing them access to every uh, new program or piece of software they want to use. Uh, their operating system is, as far as they know, you know, the Facebook landing page. Um, and this is something that Facebook is very excited about. You know, they're trying to push forth new internet access plans that leave you at a Facebook landing page. They provide you access to a limited subset of services rather than the free and open internet. Now, in terms of how do we accommodate this? How do we how do we fight back against that? The challenge here is we have to do, we have to do better. Fundamentally, when we look at human nature, people are driven by incentives. Uh, the average person is not an expert. Uh, they don't want to be an expert. They don't care. Learning is not fun. Uh, learning is not something exciting. Learning is a chore. It's, it's something that they're forced to do uh, to achieve their goals. And the more uh, that groups can reduce that burden of knowledge, uh, the more people are inclined to use those services. Uh, now, this is fundamentally contrary uh, to what we need, sort of the survival skills for the modern status quo, because you simply cannot operate safely on the internet today without understanding what the underlying backbone looks like, how it functions beneath the covers. But it does not have to be that way. We can provide people basic skills. Uh, we can provide people basic understandings uh, by teaching them as they go, uh, by unlocking features and capabilities as they use programs that explain it bit by bit, uh, kind of a gamification of the interface here, uh, that teach people uh, as they use it in a way that's fun, in a way that's enjoyable, in a way that's not burdensome, but is actually enjoyable. This is, is something that we need to work on a lot. Uh, there is an alternate idea here, which uh, is quite popular, but I'm not sure it's as realistic as presuming that people will never have to learn anything anywhere, uh, but is the ideal. And that's that we compete uh, directly with these billion dollar uh, corporate interests and we win, uh, that we are more successful 
uh, in providing services that are frictionless, uh, that are just as attractive, uh, just as easy to use as Android or uh, iOS, but aren't as dangerous to the individual's sovereignty, to the individual's rights, to the individual's ability to communicate and associate in a free and safe way. Snowden, do you hear us properly now? I do, that's much better, thank you. Hi, uh, I have another question and it kind of ties in a bit to the previous question. Uh, you were talking about political and legal and technical solutions to the privacy problem. And I think um, we also need to think about a civil solution and how people can use alternative tools to communication, to browsing. And uh, what people always say not to do this and to justify kind of, despite their awareness, to justify not using these alternatives is saying, I have nothing to hide. So what would be your short answer maybe and a long answer to somebody who says that? And what do you think in the long term would a society look like where people say that they have nothing to hide? Thanks. The, uh, the answer that I normally give in response to this question, because it is a common one, uh, is that we need to think about what rights are for, how they work, where does the value derive from them, and what is privacy really? Uh, the main challenge that we face in the messaging context, in the communications context, whether we're talking about journalists, whether we're talking about activists, whether we're talking about reformers, uh, whether we're talking about people in institutions who are sitting at the table during these policy negotiations, Uh, and maybe actually trying to work on the side of society rather than against it. Um, and the challenge is that we're asking the word privacy to do too much work. Um, privacy, this was uh, Jake, uh, I believe, originated this. Uh, privacy is what we used to call liberty. In the same breath, we say privacy is dead. Now, this is completely false. When you actually look at it a little bit further, Nobody honestly believes privacy is dead uh, because privacy is the right from which all others are derived. Privacy is the fountainhead of individuality. Uh, without privacy, there is only a collective, there's only society, there's only influence uh, from groups, from large powers that shape every person to bring them into that fold, to make them alike. Now, wh why do I say that? Uh, because when you think about privacy, uh, the word privacy, uh, that's why we have private property. Uh, you can't have anything for yourself. Uh, you, you can't have your own opinions unless you can have some space that belongs only to you. Uh, and this, this is really the thing that we need to think more about expressing. Is the, the typical formulation that I've used is Arguing that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying that you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. Or you don't care about freedom of the press because you're not a journalist. Or you don't care about freedom of religion uh, because you're not going to church actively. But the bottom line here is even if you're not using a given right at this precise moment, at, at this precise point in time, on you know a Wednesday or a Tuesday or in you know August of a particular year, that right still has value because the right makes our entire society more open. Uh, it gives us a higher quality of discourse. It gives us a higher quality of life. It gives us a better quality world, even if we don't use it directly because other people do. Saying that you don't care about a right because you're not using it personally is the most antisocial thing you can possibly say. What it's saying is that I don't care about other people. Now, particularly if this is being said by someone who occupies a position of privilege, by someone who is in the minority, uh, this is particularly um, corrosive because these are the people who need their rights the least. You know, if you're a rich old white guy sitting on the very top of society, you don't care what the laws are, you don't care what the rights are because society is ordered to protect your interest. You hold the stakes. You design the systems that protect and enshrine and entrench power. It's the minorities 
who always face the greatest risks. And this is not merely theoretical. Uh, when we look at real cases in the United States, uh, there was one where the FBI had a lead on a prominent religious figure, uh, sort of a community activist, uh, the kind of person who might be sitting in this room. Uh, and they thought, the government thought, well, maybe this person's politics are radical because they're a sleeper agent for, you know, uh, or in association with foreign governments, foreign radicals, whatever. The attorney general got the brief on it, said, okay, that's fine. I don't really like this person. Signed off on wiretaps, both of his office and his home. Even though he was a U.S. person, uh, even though there was no suspicion of actual criminality, he's placed on a watch list, the kind of thing where if uh, martial law is put forth or there are emergency measures, the kind of thing that happened in the wake of the Paris attacks, this individual would be rounded up. This would be one of the first people who's arrested and held uh, without charge just to make sure they're not doing anything sketchy. And of all of the suspects uh, who were given this kind of similar scrutiny uh, in the United States, the FBI made the determination that this was the most dangerous of all of them from the standpoint of national security. Now, when we think about what that means, what is national security, we need to think about the case. That was Martin Luther King Jr., uh, the greatest civil rights leader that the United States had ever seen. And that determination was not made in a vacuum. That determination that this person was the greatest threat to national security that the, the, we had in our country was made two days after Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, the one that, that truly led to substantive and reliable change. And when we think about uh, how these powers are used today, you know, was this just a relic of the past? Have these things been reformed? Has it stopped affecting us that way? That, that's not the case. Uh, these things are still going on in different ways. Uh, the British intelligence agency, uh, sort of the British version of NSA, the GCHQ, was spying on human rights groups such as Amnesty International, uh, using powers that were passed publicly uh, to thwart terrorists. Um, we saw that they were using their authorities to capture the emails of journalists uh, and media figures um, there were other uh, NGOs that were doing these kind of things. Uh, and this continued again and again and again. When you looked at the classified documents and saw why were these programs classified in the first place, uh, their documents did not say they were classified because they were protecting lives. They didn't say if the public knew people would die. They said if the public knew there would be a quote, this is their words, damaging public debate because we would protest the scale of their activities as we have seen happen. Uh, but this is the challenge. We are today in the midst of an environment where there is a slightly increased skepticism of the government's activities. Uh, we have seen abuses of mass surveillance uh, in very recent past. Uh, we have seen the great powers are using this without regard to whether or not an individual is actually a criminal. They simply watch everybody all of the time because that information would be interesting to have if they eventually become a criminal. And yet, despite this, we have the Parliament of France passing new and extraordinarily intrusive laws. Uh, we see in the United States similar debates are occurring where they're saying we need to reduce the security of our systems and communications in the midst of the greatest, uh, most dangerous period of the insecurity of our systems, sort of the cybersecurity threat, as the government likes to call it, uh, that we have ever faced. And this is in the country, excuse me, that holds the backbone of the internet. The United States is more vulnerable to attacks uh, that undermine our actual systems than any other nation in the world because we simply have more computerized systems to be attacked. Uh, and ones of greater complexity, ones that would have greater impact if they failed. And yet at this same period, they're saying, well, we need to weaken security, not make it stronger. How do we deal with that? This is a question that rather than me saying what we should do about it, I think it's more important for you, everyone in the audience, to think, what is the right answer here? And more importantly, what will you say about it? It's not enough to think about these things. It's not enough to believe in something. You have to actually stand for something. You have to actually say something. You have to actually risk something if you want things to get better.
Thank you. Thank you very much.